Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome to the Alhambra First United Methodist Church. Um, we're going to start with some songs, so please join me in singing our first hymn. I believe it's 363 in your hymnals. Um, we'll also have the lyrics up here. And it can it be that I should gain? We'll be seeing verses 1, 2, and 5 if you're reading from the book. forgiven the strength to forgive. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Psalms 103 verses 8 to 12. Full of mercy and grace is the Lord, patient and rich in kindness. He will not always accuse nor cherish his anger forever. Not after our sins has he dealt with us, nor requited us after our wickedness. For high is the heavens or the earth is his love over those who fear him. Far as the east from the west has he put our transgressions from us. 
Thanks be to God for the gift of these holy words. Thank you for sharing the music with us this morning. Well, it is great to be back together for this opportunity to be uh, together. We give thanks to Aldiza and Lou and Candy and Orlo for getting the altar all set up for us the other day. And, uh, 
Marge as well helped out as we took down the Christmas directories. If you remember, we did have Christmas here. That is uh, good to be back. Uh, I will remind you, we are going to be using this as our uh, devotion guide uh, during the Lenten season. This is the first Sunday of Lent. Uh, you'll find daily readings. There's a little area there if you want to write your prayers as well. It has the liturgy for our worship services. And then it has the Bible study. And you're perfectly welcome to join us at 930 on Thursday mornings via Zoom and uh, to join us in our Bible study, which will start again uh, this Thursday. Well, the world certainly has changed since the last time we met, especially in the last couple of weeks with what has been happening in Ukraine. And of course, our prayers and our concerns are with all those people. Um, United Methodist Committee on Relief, which is our United Methodist uh, group that really does wonderful work, um, is working. We have churches in Russia, in the Ukraine, in Poland, in Lithuania, Estonia, Finland, all those areas that we see, there's United Methodist churches, and there's pastors and leaders and bishops who are all trying to uh, deal with the situation that's going on. On Tuesday morning, I'll be mailing you the video from this morning's service. I also have information there for Umcor if you want to give, or if you want to write a check today and put in the offering, just write Ukraine on it, and we'll make sure it goes to the right place. Well, let us enter into a time of prayer. Most gracious God, we give you thanks for these concerns that have been raised. We also think of those concerns that were not raised, but are on our hearts, and pray, Lord, that you will be with us, give us strength. We lift up our whole world. We are moved by the images we see on our screens of the terrible things that are happening in Ukraine. We pray for peace. We pray for all the leaders in our world that they will find a way to reconcile their differences. We pray for the people of Ukraine who are being assaulted and pray, Lord, that you will help them find safety. We pray for the soldiers that they would have a change of heart and throw down their weapons. We pray, Lord, that there would be peace in our world this day. Let us join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So during the season of Lent, we're going to be looking at the seven sayings of Jesus that Jesus said on the cross. So if you look through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will find seven times that Jesus spoke while he was on the cross. And so we're going to look at each one of those for our scripture reading and for our messages for this uh, time together. So the first one comes from Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Do you remember the story of the woman who was on a business trip? And she was boarding a flight from New York and going to Paris. And just as she was getting ready to take off, she took out her phone and put out a tweet. She was in a jovial mood and thought that she would joke with her friends. And so she said something like, hey, friends, here comes an ugly American. Well, when she got to Paris... Her phone was going off the hook. All kinds of messages were coming across. 
And she was really wondering, well, why the world was going on? Why were all these people reaching out to me? And then she saw a message from her boss. He said, do not go to the meetings with our clients. Get a flight back to New York. You're fired. What had happened? Well, while she had been sipping her champagne on first class, flying across the Atlantic Ocean, her tweet made its rounds to her friends, to her business colleagues, and maybe to the people in France. And she was no longer welcome. Her one tweet had cost her everything. Her job, her position, and her reputation. Such is the world that we live in. One tweet, one picture, one video that shows us in a bad light can ruin everything. This culture of judgment is all around us. If you run for a political office, the opposition will comb through all the records of your life to find that one misstep that they can use to cast you in the most terrible light as the worst person in the world. Uh, you remember the story of Mitt Romney when he was running for president? Uh, someone dug into all his pictures, and there they found a picture of his family in the family car on a vacation, but on top of the car was the dog, the pet dog in a crate. And they dug into it, and they found out that he had driven for 12 hours with their pet dog, Seamus, on top of the car, and uh, the dog supposedly loved the trip, but the people who saw that thought he was a terrible uh, cruelty to dogs, and of course it became a major issue in that election. His opponents were able to use that against him. Even though he said he built a windshield and everything, it was just a perfectly air-conditioned experience for his dog, and his dog seemed to enjoy it. But that didn't matter. The image and the picture was enough to really make it hard on him. This culture of judgment affects us all. Now, most of us are probably not applying for jobs, but if you were applying for a job, or, or if you have a, a, a child or a grandchild applying to college, do you know what they do? Well, they will comb through all the social media, the TikToks and the Facebooks and all the uh, images that they can find to sort of get a picture of who you really are. And of course, if you go through even our own Facebook, we'll probably find some, some pictures we wish we had it put up. But do you know what is even worse? Is if they go online and they don't find anything about you. That means that you must be a social outcast and no one likes you. <laughs> But that is the world that we find ourselves in. This world in which we are judged constantly. Many detractors of Christianity will say that Christians are too judgmental. They are against everything and they look down on people who are different from them. In some cases they are probably right. I remember my mom telling me as a teenager, she remembers that she was forbidden from dancing and playing cards at her church. The only thing that they could do for fun was to go to Passing the First, go in the basement, and roller skate. Somehow roller skating was allowed, but dancing wasn't. Who knows? <laughs> but we can see that judgment is not at the heart of the gospel. On the cross, Jesus gave the first of his seven expressions when he said, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they are doing. What was his message? Forgive, not judge, is at the heart of the Christian message. Instead of canceling, the gospel offers grace. Luke 6, verse 37 says, Learn to be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and others will give to you. Notice the duality of this passage. It's almost like 
an equation. Now, I wasn't really great in math, I must admit, but this looks like an equation to me. Notice what it says. You will be treated by God the same way you treat others. The Lord's Prayer carries the same message. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When we stand before the cross, we come to face to face with how the gospel speaks about grace. On the one hand, our sin, the sin of the whole world, nailed Jesus to the cross. But on the other hand, through Jesus, our sins are forgiven. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they are doing. He utters the words that got him in the most trouble with the religious authorities of his time. In the heart of Jerusalem was the temple, and the temple was the great monument to the one true God. King Herod had spent 30 years building it. It was so fantastic, such attention to detail that on top, there were golden spikes refined just sharp enough to keep birds from landing on top of the roof. That's the detail that they took. And it was one of the great wonders of the world. In Rome, you had the temple to Jupiter, which was the equivalent to Zeus. In Athens, you had the Parthenon, dedicated to the goddess Athena. And in Jerusalem, you had the temple, which was dedicated to the one true God. In the traditions of that time, in order to be forgiven, you needed to go to the temple and make an animal sacrifice, usually a lamb or a dove, to cover your sins. It was only the priest in the temple who could pronounce the forgiveness of sins. Jesus got in trouble because he challenged that whole notion. When he was forgiving people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were up in arms. In Luke 7, we have the story of the woman who burst into the middle of a dinner party that Jesus was having at the house of a Pharisee. And this woman came in, and she knelt at Jesus' feet and poured oil on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the Pharisees were shocked. They couldn't believe that Jesus would let this woman touch him. And Jesus said to her, Therefore I tell you, as he's talking to the Pharisees. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those at the table began to say among themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. When Jesus says, forgive them, the people who were there at the foot of the cross heard another message. They heard all the other times he had pronounced forgiveness to all the people he had healed and touched in his ministry. And there were those in the crowd who had heard those words personally. You are forgiven. Go in peace. This is the message that has a profound effect on our lives. In the hymn, How Can It Be That I Should Gain, the song that we sung earlier today, written by Charles Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist movement, penned these words, Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Now, for a long time when I was growing up, I had a hard time understanding this whole sin and forgiveness thing and how it worked. But I took a class at Fuller Seminary with Professor Archhart, who was the head of the School of Psychology, and this is how he explained it, and it's the thing that's made the most sense to me. He says, before we are Christians, 
in our heart is sin. And that sin affects all aspects of our life. It affects our relationship to God. It affects our relationships to those around us. It affects our relationship to the creation. And if you remember the story of Adam and Eve, that at that time, when God said to them, you know, why have you, um, you know, eaten of the apple, of the fruit? And he said to them, you have sinned against me, against one another, and against the creation. And that's what this is talking about. So the sin that we engage in in our lives affects all aspects of our life. But when we become Christian, our heart is turned around. But the rest of our life will be dealing with the result of that sin, the impact of that sin in those relationships around us. I thought that was a wonderful way to understand. In other words, lots of times people say, well, you know, just forget it. Forget what I did. It doesn't matter. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is asking others to forgive us for the things that we have done and then to seek healing in the midst of the brokenness of that relationship. In other words, forgiveness is not just a one-time thing. And if you think about your relationships and the times when you've had disagreements or arguments or hurt someone, you realize that it's not something that just goes away by just saying, forgive me. It is an ongoing process that many times carries throughout our whole life to bring healing to that relationship. Jesus exhibited that in his life as well. Remember Peter, his closest friend, the person who he said, on this rock, I will build my church. And remember at the Last Supper, how he said to Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter protested and said, no way am I going to do that, Jesus. That's, that's ridiculous. I would never deny knowing you. But after Jesus was arrested, what happened? Peter denied him. Three times as he was standing by a fire. And he fled the city and went back to Galilee. But after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples and to Peter. They were fishing out on the water and Peter recognized him and, and swam ashore. And Jesus talked to him. And he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. And he said, feed my children. And Jesus said that to him three times. Well, you have to wonder, why do we have that story? What, what is that trying to tell us about forgiveness? Jesus realized that if Peter didn't deal with what he did, and if Jesus didn't engage in that conversation with him and tell him, Peter, I forgive you, you can go out into the world in my name now. It's going to be okay. If Jesus hadn't done that, Peter never would have become the leader of the church he still would have been stuck in that pain that he had felt from denying Jesus. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. The good news today is that you, I'll forgive 
Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, you have new life. You have a second chance at everything that is before you. So I encourage you, live into the forgiveness of Jesus. And exhibit that forgiveness and receive that forgiveness so that you can be made whole. Let us pray. Most gracious Lord, we know in our heart that we need your forgiveness. And we give you thanks that you offer it to us even at this moment. Help us to be willing to humble ourselves and to receive your grace so that we may be free to love those around us and free to love you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Together!